الرحيم نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته محمد رمضان وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته to you also it's part of a tradition that when, gives, when someone gives you salam and you are able to respond then you should respond to that person generally uh, this is the tradition that we have this is a sunnah that we follow of our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam of course if you're busy reciting quran you're engaged in a conversation with somebody then you don't need to respond and the best form of salam is assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh you don't need to give more than that because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam neither gave more than that um, so in other words to give more to go beyond what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has instructed us to give or to do uh, shows uh, a form of disrespect towards him sallallahu alaihi wasallam but in any case i'll give you salam you should try and respond but if someone doesn't respond to you you don't need to be offended uh, they will no doubt have a very good reason as to why they haven't responded and this is the this is the way of a believer that they interpret events always in a good manner when they see something in their muslim brother or sister and it might be something that they don't like they try and interpret it in a good way first and foremost bismillah ta'ala anyway we were talking about the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we were talking about some lessons that we can learn from his experience in the cave and what happened to him with jibril alayhi salatu wasalam so one of the things that we also learn is that uh, seclusion uh, being attached or detached rather from society for short periods of time is very very useful the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was spending time in the cave away from society connecting with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and solitude is something that's important however when you're detached from society when you're doing zikr or you're just doing your own thing uh, with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's important to bear in mind that it's not a permanent state i you only meant to do it for a short while and uh, no sheikh no shaykh will ever say that you're supposed to do this for the rest of your life because in our religion there is moderation there's balance so you're meant to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you're meant to spend time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but at the same time uh, our religion Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognizes that we have duties and responsibilities towards our spouse our partner towards our family etc so there is this balance Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran um, talking to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but by definition it also applies to us and this was one of the first last verses to actually be revealed to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is very very interesting so the first verses were revealed to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he was in isolation when he was spending time himself in seclusion in the mountain and the last few verses the last verse to be revealed to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also tell him to spend time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he's instructed to do that Allah says in the Quran in uh, surah al-am nashrah right fa idha faraghta fansab wa ila rabbika farghab that when you're done fulfilling your obligation when you're done looking after your family when you're done with your homework when you're done with um, making the food doing all you need to do for your family spend some time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala empty your heart of the world and spend some time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa ila rabbika farghab and seek out your lord the month of ramadan is literally about to start we're not far away from the month of ramadan so spend time with Allah subhanahu wa spend this month um with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Sh- shut down things that are not important you can come back to that after ramadan things that you can continue with after ramadan do all of that after the one for ramadan so this is very very important and we're blessed to have the one for ramadan wherein the quran is revealed inshallah we will continue with the seerah uh during the month for ramadan tomorrow we will continue as well we'll have it slightly later at 7:45 but we will continue so this is another lesson that we learned that's moderation that's important to spend time with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but our religion is also a religion of moderation which expects us also to fulfill rights of other fellow human beings 
Then the Prophet ﷺ, when he would go to the cave, he would take food with him. He would take provisions with him. In other words, he knew that he was going to be there for a long time. He knew that he needs food. So he would take food with him, even though he's doing a very virtuous act. Right. So it's not against trusting in God. There's no idea here that, you know, I'm going to take nothing with me. I'm just going to go into the desert. I'm just going to go into the mountains and I'm going to take no food with me. And I'll trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, you take precautions. An intelligent person makes precautions, does what they need to do, prepares how they need to prepare, and then they seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you, when you know you've got an exam at the end of the year, a person, an intelligent person, prepares for the exam throughout the year. They practice papers, they look at past papers, they seek out advice. Why? Because they know that the preparation will play a great role in the success. Success ultimately belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What happens sometimes is people pray fall to what's called fatalism. Fatalism basically means, oh, whatever was going to happen is going to happen. And, you know, we don't need to take no precautions. This is ignorance. This is pure stupidity. If you look at a prophet of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and by now it's clear that he is our role model. When he went into the cave, he took provisions. Coronavirus, we need to take precautions. Right? We need to follow guidance. We need to take precautions. Not only will it save your life, but in many cases, it will save lives of vulnerable people and it will support, for example, our NHS, which will feel the strain if too many people come to the hospital at one time. So this is this idea of having concern for fellow human beings. A lot of times what happens is we're so selfish in our piety, in our so-called acts of worship, that we don't even see that our acts of worship are harming other people. That's not piety. Right, piety is being balanced in what you do and being concerned for other people. This is a true Sufi. The true Sufi is what? That they care for other people. Right? If you read about our ulama in India, for example, or South Asia rather, as an example, many of them were scholars, many of them were extremely pious people. Um, I'm not, you know, they were like amazing people when you read their histories, right? But they cared for other people, and you read in their history that Hindus would come, Sikhs would come, people of different faiths and none would come to them and seek them out. Why? Because they cared for them and they were concerned for them. So anyway, this is the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he also made provision. He was prepared and he was always, you know, he took food with him. And so as believers, we may take on challenges or things are going to come towards us. We prepare to the best of our belief, uh, ability and then we trust in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Whatever is going to happen after that, that's in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we know that in our heart, we made preparation. We prepared for it in the best way possible. So we trust in Allah. And there's this humility. So preparation in a, for the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to serve the deen is the right thing to do. If things don't work out, trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Musa alayhi salatu wa when he fled his persecutors uh, in Egypt and he was in hunger, he was completely starving and he needed food, he turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says, as Allah mentions in the Quran, Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin faqeer. Oh Allah, whatever you good you provide to me, I am in need of it. Okay, so at the same time we make dua, we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we beseech him, but we make dawa as well, i.e. we prepare for the journey as well, or whatever else we're doing in life as well. The next thing, um, that the Prophet would also come home regularly. So it wasn't like he was in the cave for an exponentially long period of time. The Prophet would descend the cave and come home to his wife as well. Right. So when people go out in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or when we are engaged in whatever actions we are, never forget your duties and your responsibilities at home. Home is everything, right? If you're neglecting your house, right, and your house is on fire even, proverbially speaking, metaphorically speaking, right? There's issues in your house. Your children are not practicing the deed. And you're going out there giving that one to everybody else. You need to put out a fire in your house first. And you need to have stability at home first. You need to know that what's important to me right now is my family. The Prophet ﷺ would visit his wife uh, regularly, even though he was connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. And the next point is obviously whenever he would go out, he would let his wife know. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha knew exactly where her husband was going. Right. So as 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 partners in marriage, 
We need to make sure that our sponsors know about our whereabouts. We shouldn't hide our movements from them uh, because this breeds suspicion. And suspicion is a very, very, very toxic thing, right? When, when trust breaks down in marriage, it can be very, very harmful and it can take a while to come back. Inshallah, it will come back. There's, 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 there's no doubt in that, but it's very difficult to gain that trust straight away. And it takes time to build that trust. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for all of us, uh, make it easy for all of us. And so sometimes just letting people know that you're just going here and there, letting people know about your whereabouts is important. Okay. Um, when Jibreel alayhi salatu salam, the next point, when Jibreel alayhi salatu salam embraced the Prophet three times, very strongly embracing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was essentially uh, preparing him and giving him spirituality and his angelic attributes dominated the nature of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that his heart, in other words, this was preparing the Prophet to receive revelation for the rest of his life now, okay, uh, because it's a very heavy thing. And so the unseen mysteries and divine knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would come to him. And Jibreel was obviously the medium through which the Prophet was receiving revelation. Allah was sending revelation to him through Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam as well. And this used to happen to a lot of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn Abbas himself says that once the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hugged him and made dua for him. What dua did he make? Allahumma allimhu al-kitab. Oh Allah, give him knowledge of the book. Allahumma allimhu al-kitab. Allah, give him knowledge of the book, i.e. give him knowledge of the Quran. And then he became one of the most, he became the, one of the foremost leaders, uh, experts in the understanding of the Quran of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah, when the month of Ramadan comes out, Allah gave, gives us all a connection with the Quran. Recite the Quran in abundance as much as you can, but try to understand some of the Quran. Inshallah, we'll have some courses as well. But whenever you can, try and read some translations of the Quran, some explanations of the Quran. Engage with the Quran. When you open the Quran, ask Allah, Allah, open the Quran up for me and make it, make it accessible to me. Teach me something. Let, I'm in need. Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin faqeer. As Musa alayhi salatu said, I am complete need of Allah. Allah, teach me something here. And this is how knowledge comes to a person, that they have a humility and humbleness before knowledge, right? Arrogant people uh, don't learn true knowledge. People who are filled with pride don't learn true knowledge. And the greatest example of that is Iblis, right? He was very, very knowledgeable, knowledgeable but he was filled with the disease of pride. We seek Allah's protection. Abu Huraira himself also narrates that he once came to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he essentially complained to him, O Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I hear things from you, but I forget them. I forget them afterwards. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, lay the sheet at your wedding, lay it on the ground. And then when he laid it on the ground, it was he, the Prophet Sallallahu was as though um, giving the image that he was playing, he was he was placing two piles of something into the sheet. You couldn't see it, but there were two things, two piles of something. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi or two handfuls of something were be, were being placed into the sheet. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi was left and then closed, the, gave him the sheet. to take the sheet and wrap it around you, wrap it around you. And he said, I grabbed it and I hold it close to my chest. And he said, I've never forgotten a single hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam after that time. This is the spiritual phase, the spiritual barakah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. One of the commentators on this hadith, one of the most famous commentators on this hadith, Hafiz ibn Hajar al asqalani rahimahullah, says that this was something. This was something from another world, which we can't see, but it was this idea of memory. Rasulullah was giving him this parcel, two parcels of memory. Obviously, memory is something that uh, we can't see, right? It's intangible. Um, the closest example we can give is data sticks, memory sticks, right? They hold memory. So the Prophet was giving him this sort of memory to memorize things and never to forget things. So memorization, being able to memorize and recall things is a big gift in our tradition because in our tradition, we hold memorization very, very high. Being able to recall things, being able to recite things. Of course, that comes also and should also come with a deep understanding as well. We seek Allah's guidance in this as well. The next point, uh, Allama TB mentions, a sheikh mentions that if you look at the verses of the Quran that were revealed to him, Iqra bismi rabbika khalaq, 
خلق الإنسان من علق the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said ما أنا بقارن I'm not able to read I'm not literate I'm not educated I don't read I don't write this is the implication of what the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said and so Allah is teaching us that um, knowledge can be acquired in different ways one of the ways that we're familiar with of learning knowledge is علم كتابي علم كتابي كتابي is through books through teachers right we learn knowledge by reading studying writing, making notes, watching uh, our teachers' teachers or listening to our teachers' teachers. This is one of the modes of knowledge. Another way of learning knowledge is not through kitabs, but it's what's called ilmi laduni. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, Allah just puts it in you. Allah just places it in your heart and uh, you learn things that you didn't even learn, you didn't even read anywhere, right? And this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a form of divinely inspired knowledge. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given the latter. He was given divine knowledge. In other words, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't learn by reading books. And one of the reasons the ulama tell us this is important is that it proves the Prophet of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If he was able to read, if he could read and write, then people could say, and people have said this, that uh, he got all of this. Uh, revelations and all the things that he's talking about. Na'udhu billahi min zalik. We seek Allah's protection from making this accusation that he heard, he read this in the Bible, he read this in Torah, and he just made it up himself. But we can say the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was never educated, so where would he get this from? Right? So this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. And Allah also teaches us that there are means that I can teach you knowledge with. There are means that I can use to give you something. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us things. Right? Allah is the musabbibul asbab, the ultimate provider of all our needs. But at the same time, in this experience, we also learn that Allah can also give without means. I.e., the Prophet ﷺ didn't need to go to college. He didn't need to go to school. He didn't need to go to madrasa. Right? He, he learned knowledge without means. I.e., Allah just gave the knowledge to him. Right? But in most cases, people have to adopt the means. What Allah says in the Quran, for example, وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعْلَمْ that we taught you what you never knew. وَكَانَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ عَظِيمًا And the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an enormous grace from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something to bear in mind as well. So, um, and the next point is important as well. Khadir, Khadir radiallahu ta'ala anha, and we can learn lots of intelligent things from her. I mentioned this yesterday as well, that when she heard what the Prophet went through, and then she, she, she praised him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This teaches us that it's okay to praise people in front of them as long as we know that by praising them in front of them, it's not going to create pride, right? Generally speaking, our teachers don't like to be praised in public. In fact, they don't like praise at all. But if you can see some benefit in praising them, for example, some ulama give the example that if you praise someone um, in front of others, then they know who this person is. Like they recognize this person. They respect this person. Otherwise, they might mistreat this person. So, for example, there's a very famous example back in history where the ulama uh, used to wear long sleeves on their thobes, on their clothing. And um, this wasn't because they wanted to show off that they were ulama. Uh, the reason being was that when they would go to the marketplace, um, sometimes in the supermarkets, if you like, or in the marketplaces, Bad practices happen. People cheat, people lie, people don't give exactly what they need to, the exact amount. Um, so to protect the people, the ulama were aware this because to betray a pious person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to lie to them, to deceive them, would be harmful to you as a person who runs a market, it affect your business and it's haram, right? So to protect them, they, they, they'd show that these people are ulama, people of knowledge. The idea is that sometimes we need to give titles to be Maulana, Mufti, whatever it is. It's not a show off, it's to let people know that this person's worthy of respect. Even secular qualifications, like someone might be a professor, someone might be a doctor, or ghayra. the idea is that it's to respect them. As long as there's no, we don't feel that by doing that, there's going to be pride in them. Um, so this is something that we learn from Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha as well. And we also learn here that when, he, when it first happened to him, he went straight to his wife. So we learn here that when you have problems and ishqal, go to your spouse. Your spouse, your marriage and your relationship sh should be such that when you have issues that you can go to your partner and confine in them, uh, find solace in them as well. Um, and we learn another incident. Another incident we can learn from this is that when something difficult happens to you, 
it's good to go to an elder. It's good to go to a senior person in the community who's well respected. And in this case, they went to Waraqa bin Nawfal, right? He wasn't a Muslim at the time, but he was well respected. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Hazrat Khalilah radiallahu ta'ala went to him as well. Um, and then obviously the Prophet sallallahu didn't go alone. He, uh, he went with his wife. So in other words, when you go sometimes to meet someone important, someone significant, it's worthwhile taking someone with you as well, rather than going on your own, just to give you that comfort as well. These are adab that we can learn from this experience as well. And so we also learn here that a scholar uh, like Waraka bin Nawfal um, was so pious and he understood that even someone who was younger than him, i.e. the Prophet Sultan was young, much, much younger than Waraka bin Nawfal uh, and he was a scholar. But when he saw someone that was younger, uh, but he, he realized that this person is going to be someone of great uloom. He humbled himself before him. Right? This is something that we learn. Uh, one my grandfather used to say that, you know, uh, um, you know, I might be older than you in age, for example, but in knowledge, you're older than me. I, we should, we, there should always be respect between people of different age, age groups. But when it comes to people of knowledge, when it comes to people of ilm, uh, they, we, should, we should know our place. Right, even though we might be older than him, but if Allah has given them ilm, then we should respect them by virtue of that knowledge. In our tradition, mashallah, when we have someone that's half the Quran, someone has memorized the Quran, we respect them. When someone has studied deen, we respect them. Okay, so this is this idea. So Waraqa bin Nawfal respected the Prophet and humbled himself despite the fact he was a scholar himself, but he recognized the potentiality of the Prophet. A few more than I'll end, inshallah, as well. That when you go to someone that's pious or older than you and you're seeking counsel, advice from them, one should remain silent unless they ask to speak. So Waraqa bin Nawfal, when he spoke uh, to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he, he, he asked him to speak, i.e. he said, for example, nephew, tell me what do you see? What did you see? In other words, we should respect ourselves when we're in the presence of pious people. There should be some sort of adab there and we don't need to just speak, just, you know, um, willy-nilly, but when we're asked to speak. Uh, this is something that's lost. A lot of times uh, you're in groups, you're in conversations, and the, the person that's least knowledgeable in that field is speaking. And the person that's most knowledgeable hasn't even been given an opportunity to speak. Uh, so this other is very, very important. Yes, of course, if you have something that's important that needs to be said, you should say it as well. There's, you don't need to be a complete a coward and stay quiet. But at the same time, there's this balance. When you're asked to speak, you speak. But if you have something that's important to be said, then maybe wait till the end or get permission and say, you know what, I need to make a point as well. May I, may, I, may I make this point? Yes, you may make this point. And then you make this point as well. And this is something that's been lost in as the generations move on. This adab of our elders and ulama and people of knowledge and piety. This is very, very important. We should humble ourselves before our elders as well. Two more points. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was told by Waraka bin Nawfal that your own people will turn against you. The people that you live with will turn against you. He was astonished, right? He was surprised. The Prophet Sallallahu felt pain at this. This also shows that it's natural. It's natural. It's completely natural to love your birthplace, right? And all Anbiya Alayhi found it very, very difficult to leave their birthplace. Sometimes they had to migrate an ulama migrate and they go to different towns and cities to do khidmat of deen so when someone comes to you and they've left their home and family and moved to your community we should bear that in mind but the prophet sallallahu alayhi so was like any other human being he felt pain at the idea that he's going to be kicked out by his own community sallallahu alayhi wasallam as well the final thing i would say here is waraqa bin nawfal when he told the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam what was going to happen to him he mentioned that um I will try and help you if I'm, still, if I'm still alive. In other words, I will try to support you. I wish that I am alive when those times come, when things uh, will become challenging for you. So he was honest with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was very transparent with him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But what we learn here is very, very important, that even if you are not physically to, able to help someone for whatever reason, a good work of deen, right, there's no harm in expressing hopefulness in that you'll be able to do that. You'll be able to in, get involved in it in some way as well. Okay, even if you're not going to be able to acquire that goodness, you're making hope that inshallah, you know, Allah, Allah, if I, if Allah gives me life, I'll help you with this, Mawlana. Mufti Sahib, I'll help you with this, you know, I'll try and assist you in this, inshallah, if I'm able to do it, even if you can't, because it gives the salli, it gives comfort to the other person. And when it comes to the work of deen, and let me, let me end with this, when it comes to the work of deen, 
depending on your context, a lot of people, it can be difficult. A lot of young Darul Uloom graduates, seminarians, people who are first starting off in the community, it's very difficult for them. We have issues of pay. We don't pay them enough. We don't take care of them well enough. And then they struggle. So it's important that we give them moral support. We try and encourage them where we can. Because inshallah, if you do it the right way, 10 years from now, that person will become a great mufti, a great imam, a great leader in the community. But in the early days, it's difficult. And people by, by nature remember those moments that, you know, when I first started off in this community, when I first started doing my thing, you know, Fulan Fulan was really supportive. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ will do himself. He'll remember later on his life those who were supportive of him in his early journey when, when people believed him in him in rather small numbers. Anyway, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us love for the Prophet. Allah keep all our loved ones safe, sound and safe, bi iznillahi ta'ala. Inshallah, tomorrow the lesson will be at 7:45. May Allah keep you all safe, may Allah keep you all happy, and I'll see you tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanallah.